Thank you for joining us for the third in a series of four sessions the ACEC Research Institute is delivering in partnership with Accelerator for America and the new Partnership for Infrastructure. The Institute was relaunched earlier this year and we are focused on delivering research and thought leadership for ACEC members and our industry at large. On behalf of the ACEC Research Institute Board of Directors and our many sponsors, we are excited to support this very important initiative. We look forward to diving into today's topic on climate change and water infrastructure with our esteemed panel. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our moderator for today's session, Greg Cohen. Greg consults for the ACEC Research Institute and serves as our principal coordinator with Accelerator and the new Partnership for Infrastructure. Prior to opening his consultancy firm, Greg served as the president and CEO of the American Highway Users Alliance. He was a professional staffer on the U.S. House of Representatives Transportation and Infrastructure Committee as well. Greg is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Maryland and a former transportation engineer for the Maryland State Department of Transportation. I know he is excited about leading us through this discussion today. Greg, I'll turn it over to you. John, thank you very much. I am delighted to have uh, to be have the honor of uh, moderating this discussion today, we have a tremendous panel, um, leaders in business, um, uh, elected officials, uh, congressional staff, engineering leaders, and we're going to do a deep dive today into water and climate and resiliency issues, and I think it's going to be very educational for everyone involved. I first want to thank the partners that have been part of the project uh, to put together the Accelerator for America and ACC's uh, uh, um, 26 recommendations for the playbook. Um, the partners include WSP and Andrew uh, Petrosen's here from WSP and he'll be leading our Q&A. He's, he's really our coordinator that keeps everything going uh, in this group. Uh, Meridium, uh, City Possible, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and HNTD. And we have, uh, we have an HNTD speaker today too. So um, I want to first just discuss the process uh, by which the Accelerator for America and the new partnership uh, proceeded. Uh, Accelerator for America is a wonderful uh, do tank. They don't call themselves a think tank. They call themselves a do tank. And, and they have a tremendous network of mayors, not just any mayors, but leading mayors, really the innovators across the country. Um, and from places uh, that are small cities, medium-sized cities, and, and big cities uh, with um, very different uh, interests. And they bring them together to share their innovations and to discuss challenges. Uh, so the accelerator basically took the input of over a dozen of these local leaders and put them into ideas uh, that address these challenges and innovations and how federal policy could help in these local communities, including the key themes of sustainability, empowerment, and equity. And now we're at the point where we're um, educating people about these recommendations and advocating for them at the federal level and continuing to build the coalition. And I encourage anyone uh, on, the, on this uh, webinar to join us. Uh, there's 26 different recommendations in the playbook. Um, I encourage you all to read all 26, but today we only have time to really focus on three of them. Uh, this is an example of really all the different communities that were involved in putting together these 26 recommendations. As you can see, they're from all over the country. And now we'll go to today's topic, which again is innovation in climate resiliency and water infrastructure. Climate and resilience has emerged as a key priority for local decision makers, uh, not, uh, not just because of the pandemic, but over a long period of time. And local decision makers are concerned about their communities, how they can respond to the crisis, how to deal with um, climate change, and also how to address uh, improvements, thinking about health, economic, and social impacts of their future challenges with the goal of advancing and improving quality of life for the residents throughout. Uh, as I mentioned, we only have time for three recommendations to get a deep dive in today, but we're gonna discuss outcome-based uh, water permitting, federal funds for betterments, which you'll learn a little bit more about what betterments are, 
and increasing WIFIA's uh, capacity. WIFIA is the water uh, fin innovative financing um, um, tool that is the federal uh, financing tool. So I'm delighted to start us off with, uh, I'll call it a keynote address. I know it's just an opening statement, but you know, since we can't be in person, if we were in person, it would be a keynote address, but um, we're just delighted to have the mayor of Nampa, Idaho, um, those of you who are not familiar with NAMPA, it's, uh, it's about a half an hour west of Boise. Uh, Debbie Kling is a true leader uh, among the mayors of our country. She was sworn in on January 2nd, 2018. Before that, she has a strong business background. She ran the, the NAMPA Chamber of Commerce uh, for six years before taking public office. And then prior to that, worked for Unity Media Group, it was the general manager of Quest Arena. Um, she worked for Governor uh, Kempthorne in Idaho, organizing meetings for the National Governors Association and the Western Governors Association, and has had a variety of leadership roles that you can read about on this slide. Uh, she's also currently serving on two uh, boards as the, uh, the Board uh, for Community Planning Association and the Valley Regional Transit Service in Idaho. So with that, I will turn it over to Mayor Kling. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to join you today as part of the ACEC Research Institute webinar series. So it's a privilege to be here. I'd also like to um, comment on and communicate how much I appreciate the work of Accelerator for America, co-founded by Mayor Eric Garcetti and President and CEO Rick Jacobs. Um, I appreciate their commitment to and focus on infrastructure and America's new playbook on infrastructure that they have developed. So it's been great. But as I move on, I, I wanna take a minute to acknowledge ACEC and the important work that is done by engineers across our country. While much of the work that they do, an engineer does, is not necessarily seen, right? Because as many times it's underground, it's in buildings, but it is truly the foundation and the backbone of every community across our entire nation. And so I just want to say to our engineers, thank you for what you do, because it's a very important role and I appreciate it. I love the engineers that I get to work with. And so uh, they play a very key role in our community. So as we talk today and as I kick it off, as mayor of a local community, one thing that I, I do know, mayors are doers, as uh, the um, Accelerator for America is a do tank instead of a think tank, we're also doers. And if there are any other mayors on the call or elected officials, I'd like to just say thank you for all that you do. And um, so I, like mayors and elected officials across the nation, uh, deal with infrastructure on a regular basis. And today, while our topic is about uh, the water and climate and resilience, I mean, the infrastructure we deal with in general is transportation, aging roads, bridges to water, wastewater, stormwater, power, broadband, you know, just utility infrastructure in general. As a regular course of our work, infrastructure is key to what we do every day. So um, as mayor of a community of just over 100,000, uh, we're a quickly growing city. Um, the Treasure Valley, which includes Boise, Meridian, Nampa, and then surrounding smaller communities, we are seeing unprecedented growth. And uh, as we deal with that growth, infrastructure plays a very critical role. So um, the really, the question is, why is infrastructure so critical today? And I think we all know this, so I'm, this is where I, I know that you guys know what I'm saying. And that is due to the lack of federal funding and state funding and sometimes local funding, we're dealing with aging infrastructure, right? So the needs are different in every community, but um, to some degree, most communities across the United States are dealing with the, the costs of dealing with aging infrastructure. The other thing like that we're dealing with and some other communities are dealing with the same thing and that is growth, unprecedented growth. And for many cities, it's creating a great challenge as it is with us because the funding does not keep pace with the growth and needing to fund the infrastructure. How are we funding the, for us, where it's wells, right? And lift stations that are getting the wastewater back to the, the, the plant, but, and then the plant, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, our wastewater treatment plant. Um, recently, we did a, a receive voter approval to go after a $165 million bond. And for the massive large cities, that's not a lot. For our city, it was a lot. 
And, um, and that was to fund improvements to our wastewater treatment plant. That funding that we received was uh, from the state revolving fund, uh, the SRF loan, um, which is, uh, as most people are probably familiar with it, but it's passed down from the federal government to the state level. And it is a very important tool. So for us, that was a key tool that we needed to actually build what we needed to build. So the impetus for our project was both capacity and meeting regulatory requirements. And so that had to do with the temperature and phosphorus. We could stay on that topic for a long time because it's, it's very challenging and costly to local communities to meet the regulatory requirements that we have to meet as local communities. So it can be devastating to smaller communities. Um, so just a quick comment that we need uh, permitting processes to support flexibility at the local level. So um, with a focus on being environmentally friendly, right, and sustainability, which was key for our community, we decided to also to go after a reuse permit. So, and that was going to allow our wastewater to be the discharge to be integrated into our irrigation system and our pressurized irrigation system for the city of Nampa. So we could reuse that water. We also are with class A water are have hoped to be funding and providing that to business users that have high water demands. And so the key is getting being able to reuse that water. Um, the, the good news with that was um, from a sustainability standpoint, um, we're reusing our water. It's not going, it's not just going down the road. Um, it also helps replenish uh, possibly the aquifers in our local area. So that's a good thing. Um, one of the challenges that uh, we're facing right now while we're still in that process is actually who owns the water when you discharge it out of your wastewater treatment system. Um, for us, there's a little bit of a challenge from an irrigation district because it's going to reduce the amount of water that, they're re that they are receiving as it goes down. And this is just a side note um, that's interesting is that when you think about it, discharging from a wastewater treatment plant and trying to get those, uh, the, the numbers down, um, the farmers put the phosphorus back in. So it's really a complex issue and it has to do with waters of the U.S. And I'm going to, I'll leave it at that because you could talk a long time on those issues. We have some great presenters coming. So I'm gonna wrap up by saying just a couple things. Partnerships are critical. Local government working with the regional and state levels are critical. We need to enhance intergovernmental collaboration. Local government needs to be informing state and federal levels. As many times, it's the local municipality that actually is responsible for the infrastructure. Um, we also need to be identif identifying funding solutions and uh, forging, we need to forge collaborative partnerships with innovative solutions. So how we do things as we move to the future, because we're talking about sustainability and climate change and resilience, it's not gonna look the way it looked yesterday. Um, partnerships with engineering firms. And when I think about it, um, how important these engineering firms are to our local city, uh, because of the national knowledge and experience that they bring into local communities, because of their shared knowledge and what they do, that's very beneficial to local communities. So I just want to say thank you for sharing expertise with local leaders and their staffs with these engineering firms. And then resilience. Resilience is key. Fortunately, our area is not prone to disasters. But cities across our nation just this year have been greatly affected by, have been greatly affected by natural disasters. The flooding, the fires, the power outages, they've impacted hundreds of thousands across our nation. And for those impacted, I wanna say my heart goes out to you. Um, as local municipalities along with the state and federal agencies, we have a responsibility to quickly respond to everything, to get it up and running again once we've had a natural disaster occur the plans that we have in place today, along with future innovative design that supports resiliency, is key to responding to those disasters and protecting the lives of our citizens. So um, I appreciate the work of, of all of those that represent your organization, ACEC. 
uh, because they're key to the resilience and the future of our nation because of the foundation um, and the work that is done within this association. So I just want to, uh, that was just a very, very fast blush and we could dig in to any number of topics uh, within that. But I just want to say thank you again for the opportunity of joining you today. Um, thank you all for the work you do that makes our world a better place. And I look forward to the discussion that, that's going to commence at this point. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, I want to encourage the participants uh, that are here to use that chat box and the Q&A box to ask questions. Uh, Mayor has graciously agreed to uh, stay to the end. Um, and, uh, you know, this is really a, a unique opportunity. Uh, I work in Washington, D.C. A lot of policymakers are here in D.C. on federal policy, and it's easy to hear from the states because it's a defined number, 50. You know how many there are, and it's pretty easy to, to, to get their perspectives. But these local perspectives are so valuable and often not heard here in D.C. Uh, so thank you very much for that time. And folks, please... Uh, Go ahead and put in your questions, and we're going to move to our panel. Um, we have a tremendous panel. Uh, our first speaker is Radhika Fox. She is the CEO of the U.S. Water Alliance. Um, through the uh, Value of Water campaign, Radhika has been the leading spokesperson for the importance of investing in our nation's water infrastructure. She's widely recognized on complex water issues from equity in water to investing in infrastructure. She has more than 20 years of experience in developing policies, programs, and advocacy campaigns. She's a public speaker, has been sought after and interviewed by local, regional, and national media outlets on a wide range of water issues. Um, previously, she directed policy and government affairs for San Francisco Public Utilities Commission which is responsible for the water and wastewater, drinking water and wastewater for uh, the Bay Area. Um, she also served as federal policy director of Policy Link, where she coordinated the organization's agenda on a wide range of issues, including infrastructure investment, transportation, sustainable communities, economic inclusion, and workforce development. And she serves on the boards of Policy Link and Jobs to Move America, and there's a little bit more in there for you to read. But um, I want to turn it over to Radhika now, and uh, we're Radhika is going to focus on uh, one of the three uh, areas that are in the playbook. This is outcome-based permitting, but we'd also like to hear your perspective more broadly about uh, your work as uh, running the Value of Water campaign. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Greg, for um, that really kind introduction. And Mayor Kling, thank you for your wonderful remarks and um, all that you are doing for your city. If every city across America had a mayor like you, we would be very fortunate. I really enjoyed hearing um, about your innovation and leadership. And I also just want to um, congratulate ACEC and Accelerator for America for uh, this speaker series. I had a chance to work with Andrew and others at Accelerator for America when the uh, playbook was being developed. And so it's just so exciting to see it come to life. And uh, if you haven't read it yet, I know I read it this early this morning, uh, getting ready for this. It, it was, it's a, so many, so many good ideas um, that I think really can transform our community. So congrats on that. Um, what I love so much about the um, new partnership for infrastructure is really this focus on how do we align federal policy, state policy, to really support innovation that's happening at the local level, at the local level. So innovators like Mayor Kling. Um, you know, I think our philosophy at the U.S. Water Alliance is that those who are closest to our nation's uh, challenges, whether it's water infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, that those who are closest to the challenge are also the best position to identify and craft solutions. And so if we have a federal government that can really unleash that innovation, we can solve for so many things that our communities are struggling with. And so the U.S. Water Alliance, we are a national uh, network of local water agencies, environmental organizations, community groups, public officials like the mayor, and we're all working together to identify really practical, concrete challenges to some of our uh, most pressing water challenges, whether it's around climate resilience or 
equity and workforce challenges. Um, and again, it's really by focusing on the local innovation and spreading that, that I think we can, we can solve so many of these things. And I would say that in the context of water infrastructure, it is so important because water is fundamentally a local issue. While we, would, we wished we had a, a, a more robust uh, federal investment, as Camille will talk about uh, in a minute, the reality is that 95% of investment in water infrastructure was coming from local resources. Uh, and, and so we have to, so that is the reality of water. The reality too is local control uh, is very important when it really, when it comes to water systems. We have 55,000 drinking water utilities, 18,000 uh, wastewater utilities. And so again, progress will come when the federal government aligns with local leaders who are trying to innovate. And that's why I was so excited um, that one of the recommendations that made it into the playbook was really around this notion of outcome-based permitting. Um, so many of the local water agencies that I work with around the country you know, the, the way that they operate is, um, is very constrained by their permits from the Environmental Protection Agency. Oftentimes those uh, permits are very prescriptive and they're really focused on what action, what method, what project will you undertake to achieve the water quality improvements um, or water supply improvements that we wanna see. Um, but if we could think about how do we move to an outcome-based approach Set the goal, set the target that you want that local water agency to achieve, and then federal government, let's get out of the way um, so that they can innovate and really be creative around how to best achieve that outcome that has been set. I think one of the really terrific examples um, of that approach is in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin has huge, huge water quality challenges because of phosphorus and other nutrients that are entering the waterway because of agriculture uh, and other um, uh, industrial uses. Um, what Wisconsin has done is moved to what they call an adaptive management approach to their permits. So they work with the utilities to really set a target around what reductions we want to see in nutrients what improved water quality outcomes that, that they, they want that utility to achieve. And then they get out of the way and let them achieve that. What that's meant in Wisconsin is, um, is it, it's been phenomenal outcomes. So for example, in uh, the Yahara watershed, which is the watershed where Madison, Wisconsin is located, um, the utility said, you know, we could invest in you know, another treatment plant here or we could look upstream and we could partner with uh, agriculture so that if, if we work with agriculture and keep that, those nutrients out of the water in the first place, we don't have to treat it downstream. And so they, they now have 25 uh, municipalities in the watershed are partnering. They have, I think, over 150 farmers who are engaged. Um, they've reduced hundreds of thousands of of phosphorus from entering the waterways. And they've had tremendous savings because they've been, they, would, they didn't need to necessarily build some of the um, infrastructure systems. So what we would like to see, and again, so glad this is in the playbook, that we would love to see uh, the Environmental Protection Agency really learn from some of these innovations at the local and state level and uh, revise the, N the NPDES uh, permitting process to again move towards this outcomes-based approach. I think some folks will say, oh wait, if we don't have the stringent do X, Y, and Z and the permit, you know, the utilities won't do it, the cities won't do it. But um, what we saw in Wisconsin is um, a constant checking back in around are we achieving the goals? And if we didn't achieve the goals, the state could regulate differently. So I think if we have outcome-based approaches uh, with accountability built in, um, I think we can get a lot farther faster. So thanks for the opportunity to join you. And um, again, I encourage you to read the playbook. Thanks, Radhika. Uh, we're gonna, that, we're gonna uh, hold all the questions until all of the panelists have a chance to speak. And I'm delighted to move on to our next panelist. Uh, this is, oops, there we go. Uh, Chuck Chaitovitz is our Vice President from Envir for Environmental Affairs and Sustainability at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Chuck has more than 25 years of experience specializing in government, uh, I'm sorry, in environmental and energy issues. He's worked with a number of companies on strategies to improve their bottom line and position themselves. 
at the chamber, uh, Chuck is launching a new environment and sustainability capability, sustainability capability to foster unique partnerships among the private sector government and civil society organizations. He works with the chamber's members to support company leadership on sustainability, building the business case and enabling conditions through common sense public policy and the actions of member companies. Previously, Chuck co-founded the Coventry Group, a professional service firm focused on strategic communications, marketing and government relations. Um, this was really interesting, Chuck. The uh, international experience providing strategic counsel on water and sanitation capacity building in West Africa, nutrient management best practices in Central and Eastern Europe, and water finance case studies in the Caribbean. And there's again more to the bio here on the slide, but to keep things moving, um, I, I will turn it over to Chuck. Chuck, you may be muted. That, that's that's a danger of uh, of continuous video calls during the day. No, I, I really Happy appreciate calls. it, Greg. Yeah, no, thanks so much. And thanks to WSP, A4A, and, and ACEC for including the chamber uh, in this important discussion. Um, I'm so glad that Mayor Kling was, was here as a chamber alumni. Um, glad that, uh, that we, could, uh, we could hear the, her perspective on these important issues and look forward to the conversation. And I'm really looking forward to uh, discussing broadly with, with the, uh, the panelists and the participants going forward. Um, uh, I'm also glad to see my friend uh, and colleague Radhika Fox there from the U.S. Water Alliance, uh, you know, known for many years, and um, it's, uh, it's great to see you, Radhika. Um, for those not familiar with the Chamber, uh, we're the largest uh, uh, business trade association in the world representing all sectors, uh, all companies of all sectors and sizes. Um, we also uh, have our, uh, our, our federation, which is comprised of our member trade associations and state and local chambers. Um, and so I like to say we're at the nexus of, of companies and, and communities. Um, the chamber has long supported building modern resilient infrastructure. Um, the Betterment's recommendation, which you see here on the slide um, from the playbook is very much aligned with this commitment. Um, resilience is just good public policy. I mean, there's, there's a number of, um, uh, of studies out there that show that uh, taxpayers receive you know, anywhere from 11 to, to $4 uh, for every dollar invested in issues around pre-disaster mitigation funding and projects. Um, uh, improving lifeline infrastructure, which was mentioned by, you know, both our, our speakers earlier, you know, in this unprecedented time, um, communications, energy, food, health, water, these are all uh, issues of importance to communities um, and in, in recovering from the pandemic and responding more effectively ahead of the next crisis, they need to address these issues in a resilient way, reducing their risk and saving lives and, and money along the way. Um, and we need as many tools in the toolbox for communities to do so. Um, that's why the, the chamber is, I mentioned two examples and then would be happy to kind of turn to conversation. Um, collaborating with FEMA as they were launching the Building a Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, which as you may know, uh, in, the, uh, in the Budget Act of 2018, there was a 6% set aside of disaster funding um, uh, that, uh, that went to a pre-disaster pot. Um, and, uh, um, you know, that provides, you know, this, this new pot of money up to you know, somewhere is up to a billion dollars a year, depending on, on the year. And this is certainly a year where we're having um, significant disaster rec, rec, uh, uh, declarations um, where pre-disaster mitigation can address some of these, uh, these issues uh, for communities investing ahead of the next one. Um, we're also working with, uh, with uh, and the other thing to mention is that the first notice of funding availability was just, um, uh, just came out from FEMA and it's, uh, they're, they're working through that uh, proposal process from communities. Um, and in that process, you know, it's important to note that, that the private sector currently is not eligible for Stafford Act funding. And so 
um, there's uh, some sense, how do we work on public-private partnerships that can help leverage the money that, uh, that, that is put in there uh, by this, uh, this new funding? Uh, the additional thing that I'd like to mention is uh, some legislation that we're working on with a number of stakeholder groups called the Resilience Revolving Loan Fund, uh, built very much off of successful clean water and safe uh, drinking water SRF programs. Uh, where capitalized funds are sent to states who then provide low interest loans to communities to implement pre-disaster mitigation projects. Um, there's a number of other tools that are out there in the policy world, which we're very much interested in exploring. Um, this, is a, uh, this is good public policy. Um, the, we, we certainly want to get this, this legislation passed if we can this year. Um, the, the Senate is looking to, to bring this to the floor, we hope, this week. And so uh, looking forward to having that discussion with all of you to help support that going forward. Uh, back to you, Greg. Sure. Thank you, Chuck. I think we, uh, I hope some folks ask uh, a little bit more about uh, the WERDA bill. That's, uh, I mean, it's only in the Senate where you could have 99 members in support and still have to hope that it gets done, right? Um, our, our um, next speaker is, oops, sorry. Next speaker is Ed Crooks. Uh, uh, Ed is Senior Vice President of HNTB. And as I mentioned before, HNTB is one of the uh, steering committee members in the new partnership for infrastructure that helped shape the playbook. Uh, Ed is a infrastructure finance and project development professional. He has more than 30 years of extensive experience in P3 and alternative delivery practices. He's worked on a wide range of infrastructure investments, including uh, project and corporate finance, P3 project communication strategies, and worked in a number of market sectors, including highways, my background, water, wastewater, rail and transit, social infrastructure, and has advanced major projects, both as a private development developer and investor, and as an advisor to governments. Prior to joining HNTB, Ed was principal and founder of an infrastructure advisory firm. And he uh, recently completed serving his second term as a member of the Environmental Finance Advisory Board at US EPA and is a registered professional engineer. So with that, Ed is gonna be talking about the 24th recommendation in the playbook, which is increasing WIPIA's capacity. And Ed, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Greg. And <clears throat> thank you all for uh, uh, allowing me to, to join you today. Uh, a distinguished panel, and I've got to give a shout out back to Mayor Kling. Uh, as an engineer and representing a, a firm full of engineers, uh, we sure appreciate your kind comments. We, uh, we know our work is important. It's really nice to hear it recognized, and, and we appreciate that very much. Um, I, I'm going to talk about one of the recommendations in the, uh, in the playbook, uh, not number 24, about WIFIA. For those who, of you who might not be familiar with it, the water infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act uh, was created, a, I think it was 2014, but, but it actually became uh, uh, operational in 2017. Um, <clears throat> it's a federal loan program that uh, offers very attractive loans to private and public borrowers for up to 49% of a project cost. Um, the eligible uses of WIFIA funding are, are, are quite wide. Um, everything from new build to uh, uh, waterways, uh, water and wastewater eligible. Uh, so tremendous flexibility. Um, also, also offers flexible repayment terms. Uh, loans can go out to 35 years with uh, interest only holidays, etc. And the, the bottom line is that the cost of WIFIA financing is very, very competitive. Um, it can be uh, uh, close to uh, the, the cost of tax exempt municipal debt. Um, and because of that, it's a nice complement to other financing sources that uh, our, our local utilities are accessing today. Uh, selection criteria looks at, uh, of course, the credit worthiness of the project, uh, the benefits to the public, uh, as well as the project's readiness to enter into uh, uh, delivery. Since, it, uh, since the WIFIA office opened for business in uh, 2017, by last count, uh, 156 expressions of interest have been submitted. Uh, the the WIFIA office evaluates those for uh, their readiness to move forward into the selection process. 
uh, and then invites some of those applicants to move forward with full applications. So of 156 app, uh, letters of interest, 89 were invited to move forward. And as of today, I believe the latest number is 28 loans have actually closed. Uh, billions of dollars worth of capital, projects ranging from as small as $16 million up to, I think the biggest one I've seen in the, in the WIFIA score sheet is almost $700 million. Um, as Mayor Kling was talking about her wastewater project, it, it just reminded me that so many communities across the country uh, are, are looking at often the largest capital investment their municipality will ever make when they undertake a major improvement to a treatment plant or a, uh, a water supply project. And uh, the ability to use flexible sources of financing for these types of projects is so imperative to uh, uh, not just keeping up with uh, a state of good repair, but addressing growth, uh, addressing resiliency, and the ever evolving environmental standards that uh, our, our local water utilities are required to meet. Um, the WIFIA program has, uh, has done a nice job, I think, of, of addressing this need, um, but I, I think there's certainly capacity here to do more. Now, one of the challenges is because so many local utilities will only ever want to access a WIFIA loan one time in their history, uh, there might not be a lot of learning curve effect from uh, working with a WIFIA loan. So, uh, in, in, in Mayor Kling's case, a, a $160 plus million dollar, uh, loan is something that's, that's unusual. And understanding how to access WIFIA, uh, having done it multiple times, is probably not going to be an option for many borrowers. So the ability of the WIFIA office to, to be more aggressive in outreach, the funding that they need to do that, uh, I think is, is kind of written into this recommendation number 24. Uh, both the administrative uh, uh, authorizations for the WIFIA program, as well as the lending authorizations, need to keep pace with this enormous demand in our marketplace. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing is that the, uh, the ability of WIFIA to actually lend money depends on OMB scoring of the credit subsidy associated with the borrowers that come to the WIFIA credit window. Um, now, one of the great things about uh, the water sector is that it's a, a very, very uh, steady business. It's a very reliable financial uh, uh, endeavor. And the default rate in the water sector is quite low, which means that a, a dollar of, uh, of authorization can fund uh, uh, many dollars of, of lending. Uh, in the TIFIA program, which is the transportation uh, comparable, uh, in, the, in the USDOT, the subsidy is about 7%. So that, that's projecting that about 6 to 7% of TIFIA loans uh, could, could default. In WIFIA, that, that, those numbers are closer to 1% to 2%. So the leveraging ability of federal dollars is much greater in WIFIA. Um, one of the interesting things that I think we need to keep an eye on is whether COVID uh, will have an impact on those metrics. As, as many communities face the challenge of, uh, of reduced ability to pay, um, we could see default rates increase and that could increase the subsidy requirement, which would decrease the amount of WIFIA funding available. I, I think also part of this recommendation is the need for uh, the US government to be uh, uh, out in front of that dynamic and make sure that whatever credit subsidies are applied to the WIFIA program uh, maintain a, a comparable year-on-year -year level of funding availability. Um, and then uh, finally, I think on the administrative side of the WIFIA program, uh, the WIFIA program has, has averaged about five to $8 million a year in administrative funding. Uh, interestingly, that has not stayed in pace with the amount of loan funding. And uh, it would be, I think, a, a part of this recommendation that as, as the lending uh, amounts increase, uh, the administrative uh, authorizations should keep pace with that so that the WIFIA program is able to respond to the, um, uh, to the increased demand of the sector and in fact is able to promote the wonderful products that they offer to the industry. So with that, I will pause and Greg, I'll kick it back to you. Fantastic, thank you very much. 
um, our last panelist is actually going to be more of, a, of an opportunity to get a little bit of a reaction from the Hill. Um, we're thrilled uh, to have Camille Tuton with us. Camille is a professional staffer at the U.S. Transportation Infrastructure Committee. That title is familiar to me, and it's a, it's a hard job, and I'm really happy on the last day of the fiscal year that you could find an hour to spend with us. Uh, Camille um, has her, she's works basically with the committee's focus on the Corps of Engineers projects prior to joining TNI. She worked as a professional staffer for the Senate Energy and National Resources Committee. Oops, let me let you all see her full bio over here. And um, she shepherded several water provisions that were enacted as part of the John Dingell Conservation Management and Recreation Act of 2019. Previously, she served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Water and Science for the Department of Interior and also worked on policy issues related to the Bureau of Reclamation and the USGS. She served as a senior policy advisor for the U.S. House Natural Resources Committee, where she focused on Western water and power management. So right up uh, our mayor's alley, I'm sure. Um, Camille, delighted to have you with us. And I will turn it over to you for reaction from to the recommendations. And also maybe you can share with us a little bit of what's going on the Hill in your, in your area of expertise. Sure, Greg, I'm glad to be joined by a TNI alum. Thank you to ACEC and to uh, the Accelerated for America, as well as the Office of Mayor Garcetti for the invitation to be here today. I'm so pleased to be joining Mayor Kling and a distinguished panelist to talk about an issue of importance to the nation, water infrastructure. So I work for the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. My boss is Peter DeFazio of Oregon. Our subcommittee chairwoman is Grace Napolitano from California. We are the authorizing committee for all modes of transportation, air, uh, rail, highway, and in my case, we do uh, federal navigation through our nation's ports, harbors, and inland waterway system. But we do more than that. We have the portfolio for the Civil Works for the Army Corps of Engineers, as well as the Clean Water Act um, implementation through the Corps, as well as US EPA. I recognize I'm uh, batting clean up here, so I'll keep my comments short to uh, two pieces of legislation that we're hoping to get enacted into law later this year and happy to answer any questions afterwards. So one of the major provisions that we're working on uh, currently is the Water Resources and Development Act of 2020, HR 7575. This bill, this bipartisan bill, passed the House in July on suspension and by voice vote. What does that mean? Um, suspension is a, um, a legislative procedure that suspends the rules of the House. It's a way that you deal with legislation on a, a faster basis than regular order. And usually you reserve those bills for smaller types of bills, um, naming post offices. So the ability to get word out on suspension and also to pass by voice vote just shows the bipartisan support of this legislation. Um, in that bill, we have about 36 chiefs reports. We authorize 36 new projects that deal with navigation, flood control, and ecosystem restoration. We also, also authorize a similar amount of feasibility studies for projects to be considered by Congress in the future. And there's two policy pieces that I'd like to flag for you that would be of interest. One is the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund full utilization, which is a priority for my boss, Chairman DeFazio. What does that mean? Essentially, what we collect for harbor maintenance trusts through ad valorem taxes, we used for the operation and maintenance of our federal ports and harbors. And so what we're trying to do is um, essentially what we collect, we use, and also get at the balance, which is sitting in the, in the treasury at the moment, of roughly $10 billion. The Congressional Research Service estimates that if we spend $2 billion over five years, we'd get our federal ports and harbors at, at their widths and depths. And considering the importance of our ports and harbors to our global uh, economy, uh, it seems like a really good investment to us. Along with the HMT, we try to uh, deal with issues relevant to emerging harbors like Port Orford, as well as to other ports, including the Port of LA, the largest port in the nation. 
The other provisions in there deal specifically with the topic we're dealing with today, which is resiliency. And we recognize that uh, resiliency also has to come with issues of affordability and access. And piggybacking off of the great work that Radica and the US Water Alliance has shown on affordability issues and access to, to water, we recognize that when you deal with re resiliency, you can't take those as part and parcel. And so one of the things we look at is communities and what they need, which Mayor Kling touched on. It varies. Some need a basic technical assistance. Some need assistance with funding for feasibility studies. And so we look at that. We also look at a program that looks at repetitive loss communities. So communities that have seen repetitive flooding events twice within a 10 year period on how we can provide them with the tools they need to rebuild the infrastructure for the conditions that they're dealing with that are frankly unprecedented. And we also allow for the ability to use natural and nature-based infrastructure where it's appropriate. Um, this bill, again, passed the House. We're in, currently in conversations with, with the Senate, and we're optimistic that we can get this to the finish line this year. And we have a lot of people who support this. And thank you, Chuck, and the Chamber of Commerce for your support in um, moving word it forward. The other bill I want to talk to you about that's been touched on today is H.R. 1497 which is the Water Quality and Jobs Protection Act. Its main, main issue it deals with is the reauthorization of the Clean Water State Revolving Fund at $14 billion over five years. And there's a couple of other provisions in there as well that deal with the Green Reserve, a 15% set aside for water efficiency and energy efficiency projects. It requires a set aside of a minimum of 10% of annual clean water SRF funds to provide grants to communities with affordability concerns. And it also establishes minimum funding set asides to address water infrastructure for small and rural communities. And finally, um, relevant to what's going on on the House floor today, as part of the HEROES 2 Act, we have in there a water provision that's modeled after LIHEAP. So it's water LIHEAP. It's a low income housing, drinking water and wastewater assistance. And what it does is provides, it authorizes and appropriates $1.5 billion in grants controlled by the Department of Health and Human Services um, to ensure the continued operation of water, um, especially in times of, of the pandemic. It allows for households in, in paying their drinking water and wastewater utility bills during public health emergencies. When our first line of defense to our communities is to tell them to wash their hands, now is not the time to be cutting off water to those communities. And so this is a tool that we're hoping to use. One of the unique aspects of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, as Greg can attest to, is there is a level of uh, bipartisanship um, across the board. And so it's a really a place that we look to, and, and, and I say with optimism that we can seriously get these to not just be bills, but get enacted into law. So thank you for the time on behalf of Chairman DeFazio and Chairwoman Napolitano, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Wonderful, thank you, Camille. Uh, we have about 10 minutes or so for questions. Andrew uh, Petterson with WSP, our, our new infrastructure partner coordinator, it, um, is going to be uh, taking care of moderating the questions. Great. Thank you, Greg. And I just want to again thank Mayor Kling, Radica, uh, Chuck, Ed, and Camille so much for your time um, and for all the, the wonderful insight that you have provided um, you know, throughout this panel. Um, we have a, a question here that I, I think I'll direct to you, Mayor Kling, first, and you know, others feel free to, to join in as well. Um, a question from Wayne talking about um, you know, betterments for you know or flood mitigation and, and solutions for flood mitigation and power res resilience here are needed in many communities. You know, there's a lot of different programs, um, you know, including what we talked about with the uh, um, State Revolving Loan Fund um, and other options as well. How do you kind of go about um, kind of deciding and thinking about where to put your time and, you know, what programs to, to kind of chase um, to get these projects done? You know, this is where our consultants, and many of them are engineering firms, are so critical to a local municipality, especially for those cities that like ours that were just over 100,000 and many others that are in our size, a little bigger and smaller, you don't necessarily have the expertise internally 
to actually give that guidance. And so frequently, it's like looking at bonds. We're going out to bond counsel in a situation like this where we're looking at it, we're looking for guidance. And actually, many of our larger firms, uh, even though there may be engineering firms, but you've got other financial firms, but they actually um, have that experience from other projects. And so where you've got national firms that have been working with other cities, many times they'll bring that with them. Um, we work with a couple national firms and a couple different projects related to water. And it's been very beneficial to us, but we're looking. And then the other thing is this is where partnerships and networking comes in because we're looking to other cities and asking those questions of others because you don't necessarily know where to go. And so this is where we have to rely on those that, that do this for their living and know. I don't hope that was a pretty simple answer, but uh, we don't have all the answers. So we have to ask questions. Yeah, that was very helpful. Does anyone else on the panel have anything to add to your next question? Andrew, I'd maybe throw in a quick thought. Um, some of those sources of funding that were mentioned in the question are, are grants, essentially. They, they, are, they become sources of funds. Uh, WIFIA is a source of financing. You have to pay it back. So obviously, uh, to the extent that a municipality has access to grant funding uh, that you know is, is reasonably available and can help uh, reduce the financial commitment of, of the city or the, or, or the uh, utility district. Uh, well, that's, a, that's obviously a good thing. Um, and that can then make a, a, a WIFI loan or other credit instrument more affordable because you're having to pay back less. Great, thank you. Um, move on to another question we have here. Um, and I'll direct this towards Chuck first, but others feel free to jump in. Um, this is from, from Bikram, um, you know, um, when you're thinking about implementing various resilience initiatives, um, you know, within the corporate world, um, what are some of the barriers? Is it, you know, lack of interest or understanding um, or kind of understanding what, you know, what risks there might be um, to really, you know, uh, kind of um, getting some of these initiatives off the ground? No, I appreciate the question. So. Uh, you know, 95% of our members are, are small businesses. So, you know, we, uh, uh, so 60% of them or 65% of them don't have continuity planning. And so, you know, in, in looking at how to build resilience, uh, companies need to have a plan. And so that's, that is a big barrier to small businesses, which many of them are in you know, communities like those, uh, of, you know, with Mayor Kling, um, they need the, the resources and, and the capability to, to do that. So just as Mayor Kling was, was mentioning that they need help in, in selecting what vehicle is best for them in, in terms of funding, companies are uh, you know, in that situation without capacity are no different. They, they need that assistance. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question I'm gonna um, direct towards Radhika. Um, you know, you had, you had spoken um, about, um, you know, kind of your philosophy of, you know, those who are closest to the problem, right, or, you know, are best kind of people and of, um, understanding it and then developing solutions. Um, I don't know if, you know, and that's a theme that um, the mayor hit on as well, right, about having a more effective intergovernmental system. Um, I don't know, Radek, if you might just expound upon that thought a little bit more in your work. And I'd love to get Camille's thoughts as well from the federal side of, you know, how you think about working with your local partners. Great. Well, <clears throat> we've talked so much about water infrastructure, and I know we also wanted to hit on climate a little bit. So I think, you know, one of the um, examples I think that um, is really how different water agencies around the country are approaching climate resilience um, planning and investments. Really, with uh, this sort of turn to Camille talked about natural infrastructure or mentioned natural infrastructure a little bit around how do we actually start to work with the water uh, versus try to over engineer the water to go where we want it to go when we want it to go there. And I think, um, Andrew, in the playbook, one of the examples that you all talk about is in um, Milwaukee, I believe, where they have actually um, addressed major issues around urban flooding. Um, by actually understanding the natural flow of the water and then really trying to bring back the greenery, bring back the parks, um, and which have also become the natural uh, flood control um, uh, infrastructure, essentially. 
Um, so I think that's another great example. Um, I mean, to me, what I just hope happens as we continue to try to solve our nation's water infrastructure crisis is that we continue to have a reorientation back to asking folks like Mayor Kling, what is it that we can do as a federal government to support you and the goals that you're trying to achieve? I mean, if, if every federal government, if every federal agency uh, embodied that orientation, um, I think we could, again, have a re really renewed partnership between uh, local and federal. And, and, if, and if I could add, um, and I'm sure many of you know this, that um, er er earlier this summer, the you know, the House and Senate passed and the, and the, the President signed the, the Great American Outdoors Act, which include the, the permanent uh, funding for the, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which um, provides, it's another tool for communities to develop open space. Um, and green infrastructure is certainly part of that. And so something that we've been encouraging, you know, with uh, other stakeholders, how can we work with communities to make sure they, they understand that they, they can develop projects that are green infrastructure based um, for this and many of it might be stormwater in parks and things like that. So um, it, it important, uh, another important opportunity for, uh, for communities to engage. Well, and Camille, it looks like, I think sure. Camille maybe add one thing to that before we, I, before we close I agree it. with Radhika. I mean, every single provision, whether it's HR 1497 or WERDA, it started from us reaching out to communities uh, first and seeing what the challenges are. Um, some of them, you know, are broad brush and apply in many cases to many communities. Some of them don't. Um, but the reality is that relationship is important to make sure that the laws that we're, act we're enacting work for Americans. I hate to cut it off, but uh, um, I uh, want to respect everyone's time. And, you know, it's tough when you have 100 years worth of experience for professionals in government and engineering and business all together. Um, but this has been a terrific uh, event. I just wanted to provide the next steps. Uh, we encourage everyone to read the playbook if you haven't already, and you can find it at acceleratorforamerica.org. Um, connect with us. And um, we're going to be working on uh, COVID relief and reauthorization of the FAST Act, also any infrastructure legislation that may come about next year. And we invite you to work with us. Um, upcoming events, we have the fourth in the series of webinars coming up next week on October 7th, 30 minutes later than this one, starting at 3.30 Eastern on holistic planning and design. Um, we'll be featuring Mayor David Holt from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And then we have a big wrap up session for ACEC at their fall conference featuring Mayor Eric Garcetti from Los Angeles. So we encourage everyone who um, enjoyed this event to participate in those. And with that, I want to thank our speakers one last time. Uh, terrific session. And uh, we will, of course, be sending uh, registered uh, webinar participants and um, the audience copies of the slide deck. Um, along with uh, a, a direct link to the Accelerators Playbook. So thank you all very, very much for your time. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you next week. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank you all.